Like most people, I know that the kinds of foods I eat make a difference in how I feel and how reactivity to certain foods is different for everyone. That's why I jumped at the chance to take Everly Wells at home tests for food sensitivity. They make it so easy. You get a box in the mail with all the tools that you need to take the at home blood test, plus easy to follow instructions. You can also test your metabolism, testosterone levels, sexual health, and yes, even for COVID. And for listeners of the show, Everly Well is offering a special discount of 20% off an at-home lab test. All you have to do is go to everlywell.com slash holly. That's everlywell, E-V-E-R-L-Y-W-E-L-L.com slash holly for 20% off of your next at-home lab test. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Holly Randall Unfiltered. Before I introduce my guest, I just want to give a quick shout out to our sponsors, Dipsy. Um, It's an app full of hundreds of short, sexy stories. And for listeners of the show, Dipsy is offering an extended 30-day free trial when you go to dipsystories.com slash holly. That's 30 days of full free access when you go to dipsea.com slash holly. And now let me introduce um, our guest today. I'm so excited to have her on. She is a legend, a 29-year industry veteran. She's kinky by Polly, a black feminist pornographer, an avian hall of famer, and the founder of the BIPOC Collective. She's an advocate and a scholar. Her writing has appeared in numerous publications. We are so privileged to have here today Cinnamon Love. Oh, thank you so much. (laughs) I'm so excited to have you here. I know we've been like Talking back and forth about trying to get yeah. you on the show. So when you said you were coming out to California, I was like, hurrah. Yes. Thank you, you live in New York, right? I live in New York. Um, I was bi-coastal for about 10 years. And then I moved back in 2010. And so I like I love New York so much. It's a totally different energy from LA. And I need I need that energetic push. The, mm-hmm. the city has its own, like it breathes. It has mm-hmm. its own like it's alive. And so that kind of like, you know, energy pushes you forward in a way that the California sunshine helps you relax. It's Mm -hmm. like that New York, like rushing energy, like Mm -hmm. really is something that I need in my life. Yeah. It's definitely a different kind of city and like the people are different. You know, they talk about the laid back Californian versus like the New Yorker who's like no bullshit. It's going to tell you exactly Motivated. what they think. Mm-hmm. That kind of thing. I've been in New York a couple of times. It's a very cool city, but I have to say, having been born in California, I don't think I'll probably ever leave here. Yeah. I love New York. I, um, I, I moved to LA when I was 16. Um, I moved here when I was 14. Actually, I went to high school at Washington Prep. And um, for my sophomore year of high school, I lived with my aunt and uncle. And then I moved back when I was 16. And I just love it so much. I grew up in Flint, Michigan. So Mm. going from the freezing cold to the California sunshine was like, what is this? Like, I don't want to put clothes on ever again. Yeah. (laughs) So you are out here, um, and I know you just spoke at UCSB yesterday. Yeah. So tell us about that. What what was the panel on? Who did you speak with? Yeah. Um, so this is – I have a really long relationship with UCSB. Um, the first time I ever spoke at a university was at the college. Constance Penley – is um, who's one of the professors there was the very first person in the United States to teach pornography Mm. and she teaches it as a film class um one of her um post-grad students, um, Dr. Mireille Miller-Young, who wrote the, A Taste for Brown Sugar, A History of Black Women in Porn. Mm-hmm. I met her as a, you know, when she was at Columbia, she did her thesis on, you know, the history of black women in porn. And we developed a really, like, beautiful relationship. And when she went to UCSB, she invited me to speak at Constance's class. And it was just a so you know anytime they call i'm i'm there for them mm-hmm. because they really changed the way that academics look at pornography um the fact that back then there was no 
field. It wasn't a, a field of study, you mm-hmm. know, the way that it is now. So yesterday's panel was, I think, my 11th appearance with the two of them. Um, yesterday's panel was with Courtney Trouble and April Flores. Um, Constance reached out to us to basically kind of like recreate our panel from South by Southwest this earlier this year, Mm -hmm. where we were talking about tech trends in the industry. But we wanted to do something a little bit different. We wanted to have a conversation with the students. Um, So six of her students um, put together questions and interviewed us for two classes. It was uh, Mireille and Constance's class together um, in the Pollock Theater, which is just a beautiful, gorgeous space that you know, where they show films and they do events and things. Um, But that was just so much, it was so much fun. We talked a lot about just the, you know, stigma and what it means to be a marginalized person in the sex industry um, with, you know, April, you know, identifies as a fat woman and Mm -hmm. Courtney is a non-binary queer performer and director. And so it's like being able to approach these conversations with the students from, you know, all of our unique perspectives is just really fantastic. And the students were so great to be able to like, the questions they asked us were were really meaningful questions about what it means for us to walk through this world as marginalized people who happen to have sex for a living. Mm -hmm. Do you feel that they, they left this class like with better insight into our world? Yeah, it was so it was so good. I mean, one of their assignments was to was to research us. And so mm-hmm. they dug through our Instagrams and read our articles and did, you know, all of the deep dive to be able to come up with these questions and many of the of the students were also marginalized people. There were some queer folk, queer folks in there, some, you know, um students who are immigrants as well. And so just the way the the thoughtfulness of how they approach their questions, um, even you know, you know, thinking about how size is you know is stigmatized in our country, specific you know whether whether you're too thin, you know, quote unquote too thin or too fat. It's like when you you know these kinds of questions coming from them just meant so much. Mm-hmm. Um, it was yeah. I think they had a great understanding. We had lunch with them afterwards in the cafe in the cafeteria, which is always nice too. So. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that sounds great too. That you had what seems like a wide diversity of students mm-hmm. in the class because I know you know a lot of my listeners. Um, you know, a lot of them are involved in the adult industry, but a lot of them aren't. And uh, I know that you know people would think, oh, there's a class on porn. Like it's going to be a bunch of like young dudes who are like, oh, I get to watch porn for class credits. But it it wasn't like that at all. No, it's not like that. I mean, because, you know, because Constance teaches this class from a film studies perspective, Mm -hmm. um, it really is about porn literacy and, you know, it having them really examine the the products itself and to think about the lives of the performers as well as the 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 movie itself like it's Mm -hmm. not it's not like a film critique class Mm -hmm. it's really more about just like porn's place in society and it you know it was it's just it's just a fantastic course like I really wish that we could film it one of these days and then bring it to the public because the types of things we talked about included just like how we think about like web three or, you know, some of our concerns about these, about web three and, you know, you know, the mass onboarding of sex workers and to, you know, it's like, there's just uh, into the online space. Like there's just so many things that we can talk about that I think is really important, especially, especially for this generation that is coming up and watching porn. It's like, how, how are they interacting with it when they're not getting like sex ed in schools? Mm -hmm. Right. And so to be able to have these classes, where they can really think critically about not only what they're seeing, but the business of porn also, Mm -hmm. and to understand, you know, porn and sex work in general as labor. Um, It's a fantastic program, honestly. And to have someone like you there who's been in the industry for so long, you've seen so much change. So can you talk a little bit about your very beginnings in the adult industry and what that was like? Oh my gosh. Um, when I got into the industry, I was going through a divorce. 
Um, I actually, I got married when I was 17. I was a child bride. My husband was twice my age and it lasted two years. Um, we were, it was, it was not a good relationship. It was very toxic. And, um, I was working two jobs in the mall. I was working at Natural Wonders and I was I remember that place. in Santa Monica Mall yeah. and I was working at Gap Kids and, you know, because I had two kids under the age of two. And so, you know, you get 50% off when you work mm-hmm. at Gap. And, um, but I couldn't make my rent. I mean, I think, I think, you know, I think back then, I think minimum wage was like five twenty-five an hour. And I had an aunt who suggested that I apply for welfare because they would help pay for childcare while I went to school. But I quickly found out that I was going to have to move. My $775 a month apartment was too much money for me to accept welfare because mm-hmm. I would, my cash assistance, and I I always remember these numbers because it's just so like embedded in my mind. My cash assistance would have been like $430. And so I would have to find an apartment for under $400 a month. Even in 1992, it's like, oh, where am I supposed to find an apartment for $400 a month with with two kids? That's crazy. It's insane. And so, and I lived, and I lived in a four unit walk up in Santa Monica on 20th in Arizona. Like I had a really nice apartment and it just wasn't, it wasn't feasible. And so I started, I was also, I was attending Santa Monica college and I knew that I needed to make more money. And, you know, I'm an artsy chick. I'm a hippie at heart. You know, I followed the dead when I was 16 for a year. So it's like, I thought, oh, maybe I could be an artist model or something, but I wasn't an art student. So I had no idea what that meant, like, or where to find that work. Um, and I saw an ad in the, in the paper. Um, and it turned out to be for Reb and Jerry, who were agents at the time. They were the only other two agents besides Jim besides South. Jim South. Yeah. And I actually said no the first time. I, I, th- I said no the first time because I was like, that's not really what I was looking to do like I I the only my only exposure to porn had been like my brother trying to unscramble the cable box to watch Emmanuel and like you know I worked at a video store when I was 14 and one of my jobs was to put the box covers back Mm -hmm. in the adult section I was not supposed to be working there but you know it's it is what it is but and so I I but I never watched porn I never saw magazines before and I was just like uh know how I feel about doing that. Um, but it got to the point where I, there was one day where my son had a hole in his shoe and I was just like, what? And I was three months behind on my rent and I was like, what am I supposed to do? And so I just started calling, I was calling all these ads, trying to figure out ways to make cash. And I came across an ad for Rodney Moore and he, I met him at the West Side Pavilion in the food court. And we had a, you know, we talked and he, you know, we talked about what it would look like and what going to get tested would look like and how much money he could pay me. And I said, no. Mm -hmm. And then he called me back the next week and I said, no. And then he called me again. And every time he called, like he offered me more money. Mm -hmm. And then finally it got to the point where I was like, I really need money. Like, and so I said, yes. Mm -hmm. And, and that was it. That was, that was how I got in. Wow. So what was your first scene like? It was just Rodney and I, um, I went to a place in West LA. It was like a little teeny tiny, like clinic, like doctor's office. There was nobody in there. And I went in, I got tested. Rodney paid for the test. Like he called it, I guess, I don't know if he called ahead. I don't remember how the test got paid for, but I went in, I got tested. It was a rapid HIV test because this is long before AIM, Mm -hmm. you know? And so I went and got tested, got the paper that showed that I was negative, went to Rodney's apartment and I did my makeup in his bathroom of his little one bedroom (laughs) apartment. He set up the lights in the living room and it was just a POV scene with Rodney in the living room. Mm -hmm. And then after that, he called me frequently. The first three months I was in the business he called me all the time. I think I shot for him four or five times. He had a mail order company at the time. So mm-hmm. this is pre-internet. Mm-hmm. And he would, you know, included my photo in the catalog and would send it out to people. 
and I would, you know, he would call me when he had work for mm-hmm. me for like customs basically. Wow. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so what, how did the first scene go? Like, was it what you expected? How'd you feel afterwards? Yeah. I mean, I think I was really nervous. Mm-hmm. I remember going to, it's so funny. I'm like having flashbacks. I remember going to a little tiny lingerie store that was a, like a few blocks around the corner from my house. And I bought like some like satin ivory like bridal gown or something because I had no idea what I was supposed to wear (laughs) and I was just thinking I was like oh this is sexy (laughs) like you know so it was it was like a wedding like a honeymoon night right you know wedding night type of a thing Mm -hmm. and I was like oh this is really pretty so I I bought that and I like put it on and I did something to my hair to try Mm -hmm. to make it cute or whatever and you know I I think I saw that scene online somewhere once and I was just like this is like I, like oh my god look at my makeup like it's like look at how bad the foundation was the, the powder was all gray like you know but but it was it was fine I mean it was just he and I and it was PO and the camera and he you know everything was POV like back then Gonzo was so new mm. and that the whole like girl next door thing was very new and like what I learned later was that there were very few black women who looked like me mm-hmm. like most of the black women I mean, the business at that time had the very 80s porn star look, which was the huge like implants, the oversized implants because they were feature dancing, very thin, you know, no, not no hips, no ass. Mm-hmm. And so I was like an anomaly kind mm-hmm. of because I looked, I mean, I looked like I was a minor. So it's that having that look and that feel like, I mean, like for me, I, I've talked to other people who had really negative experiences with Rodney, um, but I was fine. Like I didn't, we just kind of hung out and it was, I felt like I was having sex with somebody that I might, you know, I was, I felt like I was having sex normally. There just happened to be a camera there. Mm-hmm. You know, it, it didn't feel like, cause there was nobody else in the room. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, I mean, I didn't, yeah, it was just weird. Like I felt like I walked away from it feeling pretty good. And then mm-hmm. when he called me again, I was like, yeah, sure. Why not? Like, you know, and with, for three months, you know, I don't, you know, shooting as much as I did, it really altered my ability to provide for my family at an age where I was just, you know, at 19, how do you, how do you, how do you do that by mm-hmm. yourself? I mean, I know people do it, but my options at that time were just very, very limited. Um, and, and it, it, it changed my life, honestly. Yeah. What was the, so tell me about like the next, maybe the next scene that you shot that had a crew that had yeah. other people there. What, what was that like? So, um, as I started working more with Rodney, um, he introduced me to other performers. Like I did a scene with him and a guy who went by Goldie, and then later changed his name to Valentino. And then I met Guy De Silva. And when I met Guy, he was like, so how long have you been in the business? Like, who else have you shot for? And I'm like, I've only shot for Rodney. And he's like, what? What do you mean? He's like, do you want to shoot for other people? Like, I can introduce you to some people. So he he introduced me to Jim South. Oh. And um, and then he introduced me to some directors, like the very typical male performer. Here, let me introduce you to some folks, and you know, and we can work together again. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um. And and it was it was fine. I mean, I'm one of my early experiences. I remember was being on a set and having another female performer think that I was someone's kid sister that the director had let sit on set because I was so young and yeah. she was like cursing him. I look so young and she was uh-huh. like cursing him out and you're going to get us all arrested. Like what the fuck is going on? And, um, and then he explained that I was a performer and she came over to me and was like, so wait, you're a performer. How long have you been performing? How old are you? Like, she was just asking me all the questions. Do you dance? I'm like, no, I don't dance. I'm in school. Like, this is what I do, mm-hmm. you know? And she's the person who taught me how to like walk in six inch stilettos and bought me my first pair of like thigh high boots and taught me how to walk to the beat of music in heels, <laughs> like, you know, and yeah. helped me, help me put together my feature shows and took me to buy, show me where to buy costumes and, and booked me to do a duo with her at Market Street Cinema. Like, it's, who was this? Um, her name was Toy Clayton. Okay. Yeah. 
Yeah, I don't know her. But yeah. that sounds amazing. I mean, like she mm-hmm. kind of took you under her wing a little bit. Yeah, definitely. Wow. And she also taught me how to like, you know, screen for in-person work and mm-hmm. um, and how to like, you know, how, where to find, where to place ads and like mm-hmm. just like things like that. Like she really taught me so much about, you know, just being a sex worker. Like mm-hmm. I think that before that I was just making extra money. Mm-hmm. Like, you know what I mean? To help supplement my other, my retail work. I mean, I was still, I worked in retail for my first eight years in the business. Oh, wow. While simultaneously doing porn and, and featuring and like all these other things. And it's, you know, even up until a few years ago, like every once in a while, I take a gig work for a little bit of time mm-hmm. because it allows you, you know, flexibility to say no when you're not dependent on, you know, on porn. But Right. Okay. So, cause I was going to ask you like, why were you still doing retail work when you were probably making more money in porn, but you like to have that kind of backup, like yeah. solid job? Yeah. I mean, and also, you know, back then there weren't as many companies. Mm-hmm. I mean, my very first movie was for this little teeny tiny unknown company called Wicked Pictures. <laughs> <laughs> You know, it was yeah. a black casting couch too. Like it was like, it was a, it was this small little bitty company and there, or actually I think that was actually for digital playground. That was for digital playground. They were still new at that time too. Mm-hmm. But, but you know, it's like there, there were not a lot of companies and there were so, I think back then there were like 200 performers in LA period. Mm-hmm. And there were maybe 20 black performers. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, it's like, you know, much like, like today, often, like ethnically am- ambiguous performers would appear in black movies, right? Mm-hmm. It's like there there just weren't a lot of companies to shoot for. So I made a lot of money my first scene, you know, and Ed Powers paid me a ton of money for my first, you know, for my first scene with him. But I didn't make a lot of money. Those, I mean, I think, I, not that I didn't make a lot of money. I think that like my first year I made like maybe $150,000, but I was also in school. Mm-hmm. I had kids. I didn't have a car. I was taking taxis back and forth from Santa Monica to the Valley when I did work. You know, I didn't really have the ability because I did have young children. I didn't have the ability to socialize in that way to be able to expand. And I didn't have the type of look that a lot of, you know, cis head white male directors were looking for. Like Mm -hmm. I had breastfed two children. So I had lost you know, breast tissue and my breasts were very flat and, but saggy at the same time, mm-hmm. you know, and, and I didn't, and I have a gap and mm-hmm. I, you know, had, you know, was curvier than a lot of other people that they were looking for. Like, I just didn't fit this like Eurocentric standard of beauty that the direct, that the companies were looking for in order for them to shoot me on mm-hmm. a consistent basis. Um, and so I had to work a mm-hmm. regular job. Yeah. Tell me, you mentioned in-person sex work. Um, tell me a little bit about that experience and, and maybe your first experience and why you decided to continue in it. And yeah. is it something that um, that you feel like was a good move for you? And, yeah. you know, like people's ideas around that yeah. versus your experience. Yeah. So <clears throat> this is an interesting, it's, it's interesting to think about this. Like I, in recent years, I came to realize that, when I was 16, I was an unhoused youth. I was a street-based unhoused youth, and I was a survival sex worker. So I was doing, I was having sex with people for a place to stay, you mm-hmm. know? It's like I, and for food, you know, I met a Rasta on Venice Beach that was selling incense and went home with him and wound up when he found out that I was homeless and stayed with him for months. Mm -hmm. You know, I would, you know, there were other unhoused youth that I stayed with and that showed me the ropes of the Hollywood, Santa Monica, Venice, you know, here's where you go to get your hot meal. Here's where you go to get clothing or a hot shower. It's like, oh, we'll stay over, you know, we're at this squat or we're staying in this motel on the beach or like whatever. And like, but even that, it's like, I was still like having sex with people for food and shelter. Mm -hmm. And so those experiences were, I, I, I did not even now I have a better understanding and framework that this is a type of sex work that a lot of unhoused youth you know, participate in. Um, and, but my, my first time 
having like consciously having sex for money. Um, my, my first, my first clients in the very beginning were all fetish clients. Like I was advertising in one of the weekly papers that the free weekly papers that you get out of the box on the, mm-hmm. on the corner. And, but every person that wanted to book me, were all looking to book me for golden showers. <laughs> like, was like, it was like, you know, they I wanted like, you to pee on that. Yes. Okay. But it was like, it was like black, girl next door, you know, barely legal girl next door, Mm -hmm. 19 years old, blah, 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 blah. And it's like, but every single person when I first started wanted me to like pee on them. Hmm. And uh, the very first time I saw someone, he bought a bottle of champagne and water and was like, you know, was like just sitting there talking with me and giving me all this stuff to drink. And then he started jerking off and he said, you know, he asked if I would mind if he exposed, if he like, if he did. And I was like, that's fine. You know, and I couldn't do it. Like I was bladder shy. And so he's like, it's okay. Like, so he just like, well, you can go in the bathroom. And he's like, do you mind if we just keep the door open? So, and he like stood in the hallway a little bit away from me so that I could have the privacy. And he was just in the hallway while I was peeing in the bathroom. And then I would come by like every week until I became more and more comfortable with him being closer to me while I was peeing. And then eventually he like brought out some newspaper and put it on the floor so he could like sit in front of me. And like, he like put his hand in the stream while I was peeing. <laughs> and like, like, like really sweet it was that, very that sweet. Was, like waiting for you to become yeah. more comfortable with Yeah, it. with him peeing on, with me peeing on him. Yeah, it was so like, it's, it was very sweet. But then, and then over the next few years, like I would find even my first time, Um, my first time featuring in, I think, Indiana, I had a guy who came to the club and like wanted me to like pee in a cup for him or like, Mm -hmm. can I, can I come back to your, you know, can I come to your hotel? Like, I would love to pay you to pee on me. And I was like, by then I was like, yeah, sure. No problem. (laughs) And he, and he showed up, but he stopped by the drugstore on the way and picked up like a bottle of perfume from like the, whatever the drugstore was and some like, and some scented body lotion and bought a bottle of cheap champagne and some waters and like some chocolate and like, and flowers and like brought it to me. It was just like so sweet that that was my first like those were my first experiences. Yeah. Do you think that maybe because these guys have a kink that most people would find repulsive, that there's some vulnerability there. And so like, they're just so grateful to find somebody who's willing to engage in that with them and not shame them about it. So like, they're, they're like grateful. They're like, Oh, let me treat this woman like a princess because she's not making me feel bad about this yeah. thing that I'm into. Yeah, I, I absolutely agree. I'm, you know, over the years I've come to discover that, you know, there are people who, you know, that who just want to like cuddle, mm-hmm. right? And there's so much shame attached to that based on the type, of, you know, the idea of what masculine, masculinity means and how they're, you know, how, how they're treated when they don't fit that stereotype. Mm -hmm. So it's like when they find someone who's willing to indulge and engage with them in these ways, they're just kind of like, oh my God, this is amazing. (laughs) So people's idea of the typical guy who would pay a sex worker for an in-person service is drastically different than what you experienced. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, and it's interesting. I mean, when I got, when I was younger, when I was in my twenties, most of my in-person clients were definitely white men, cis white men in their forties and fifties. Um, now that I am older, I find that my demographic has completely changed. Like I I would say 10 years ago, my demographic started to change. And now my, my fans and clients tend to be black and brown men between the ages of 20 to 22 to 36 Mm -hmm. or between the age of 40 and like 65. Mm -hmm. And the reason for that is that there are a lot of these younger men who their first experiences with porn was watching me. Mm. And so they're, it's, it's like they're, it's their, like their bucket list to be able to meet me, have a conversation with me. Like the, it's the older woman that they get to learn from. Right. Um, and then the younger, the older guys are guys who's, they've grown alongside me throughout my whole career. So there's that nostalgia factor. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's, but definitely it's totally different. I mean, I, I find that, you know, I've had, 
several clients who their first experiences with sex period have been with sex workers. Mm. And it's allowed them to be able to learn and grow and explore in a, in a safe capacity. Um, and, and of course, there's also the, you know, the Wall Street folks who are, you know, who just don't have time to cultivate relationships. But I think that this idea that we have that every single, you know, client is someone that a sex worker wouldn't normally have sex with, it really, you know, stigmatizes not only the us as workers, but also the clients themselves as well. You mm-hmm. know, it's like we we want to be able to have these kind of like to make let everybody feel comfortable to be able to explore their sexuality in in safe spaces. Um, you know, even just to be able to identify to their their partners, like the type of things that they're interested in, you mm-hmm. know, I mean, like, I think one of my favorite experiences was a 75 year old man who was a submissive and very much into heavy impact play mm-hmm. and had been married for 40 years and his wife didn't know that he was kinky. Mm-hmm. And as he got older, it became harder and harder for him to access these BDSM spaces because of ageism. Like he would go into a space and nobody would want to play with him. Yeah. And so like he, when we spoke, like just having that conversation with him and also going through all of the things like, well, what is your, you know, like, what are your medical conditions? Like, are you sure that you're safe to do this? Like, do you have any issues with your heart? Like, you know, like going through that stuff with him and it allowed me to be able to feel safe to play with him and to explore something that this person hadn't done in 30 years. Mm -hmm. And when we, when our scene finished and he climaxed, like he cried. Yeah. And it was because it's like, it was the first time that he had had sex, even though there was no penetration either way. Like it was the first time he'd had this kind of sex in three decades. Yeah. And I mean, and, and that is, that's really powerful. Mm-hmm. You know, we, so many of us live our lives closeted in terms of what it is that we're interested in and like. And so um, to be, you know, for people to be able to access those kinds of outlets is important. Yeah. You know, that's one of the the kind of human interest stories that I've heard so many times on this podcast, interviewing different sex workers who do in-person sex work. And just these stories of these sex workers being able to have these experiences with these people that don't normally have access to anybody who'd be willing to indulge them in their fetishes or they're afraid of women for whatever reason, or they're disabled Yeah. or they have like, I, I spoke to Alice Little and she talked about working with men, you know, on the spectrum and who have Mm -hmm. sensory process sensory processing disorders yep. and how difficult it is for them to just like have a regular date with yeah. a regular woman yeah. and, you know, just like how she kind of learns to navigate mm-hmm. whatever their like very specific needs are. And just like what, an, and you come to realize it's like an incredibly rewarding and like, fuf- it can be an incredibly fulfilling, rewarding yeah. and fulfilling experience. Yeah. And like the stigma that we have against sex work. And even, you know, somebody like me, who's been in the industry for 24 years almost, um, because I've never personally performed in sex work. I've always been behind the camera. What I've learned about it from people like you is really, you know, opened my eyes to just, I don't know, like sexuality in general and like the, the human connection that we're all looking Looking for. for. And men so often look for that in sex. Yes. And we don't like, we don't acknowledge that. And it's just like, I don't know. I guess that's yeah. my long-winded way of saying yeah. what I think you do is amazing and beautiful. Thank you. You know, something that I realized um, a couple of years ago is that um, I, you know, I have executive dysfunction, and so like there are certain like holding, you know, holding a, a regular day job is really hard for me because I show up late late all the time. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like I have time blindness, and it's you know as a even the mainstream porn is very challenging because, you know, being places on time, remembering certain things or details and being undiagnosed with executive dysfunction has been, you know, and and being undiagnosed as neurodivergent was really challenging for me and my, in my job, even maintain, even though I've had websites since 99, it's like, I've had, it's, it was hard to maintain consistency in that online work because, the administration part is very challenging for someone with executive dysfunction. So it's like to be able to, you know, 
have someone, it's much easier for me to like answer emails when I can, Mm -hmm. you know, screen someone when I can and make sure I get my deposits and then go and see them to make the same kind of money um, or more money than at the time I was making on my websites um, without, without having to go through all of those steps in order to get there. Right. Mm -hmm. It's like the administrative part of web of like the digital properties is very overwhelming for a lot of sex workers. And it's just much easier to have sex with somebody Mm -hmm. than it is to, it's like, I have to get ready, shoot the content, edit it, put it up online, you know, schedule it, put it online, do the marketing, do Mm -hmm. the socials. Like, it's like, that's a lot of steps to get from being naked to actually collecting a paycheck. And so It's like being able to just be like, oh yeah, sure. No problem. Like, you know what I mean? It's so much easier. So I personally prefer online work. I mean, in-person work as well. And plus like, you know, I had gotten to a point where, you know, I was paying my webmasters and the hosting companies more money than I was paying, than, than I was paying myself. Like I was paying myself less than I would charge other people to shoot me and also tube sites. And, you know, so being able to do in-person work and meant that I was making the same amount of money as porn in a much safer environment because I was using condoms and also didn't have my image all over the internet. Mm -hmm. Um, So like, I personally prefer it, but, you know, because of of COVID, like everybody else, you know, or like so many other people, like I had to go back and move online. Mm -hmm. Um, And even that it's been a learning curve. I mean, everything is so different than it was 15 years ago when I took my websites down um, and relearning that. And, you know, now I have much better tools to be able to manage that work, but yeah. Yeah. (laughs) I I mean, everybody who says like, oh, you know, like sex workers don't do any work and like, they don't, they They don't think about all all these girls, like making, you know, all this money on OnlyFans and stuff, just all the work that goes behind that and, and creating a website. And yeah, I run my own site and paying the hosting companies and affiliates and then the CMS program. It's like, it's a lot. There's a lot of behind the scenes. It costs. is a it's lot. Crazy. It is a lot of, of behind the scenes costs and time. Mm-hmm. And, you know, if you are not one, you know, one of the 1% of performers who's making 20, 50, a hundred thousand dollars a month, how do you hire people to do all of these things mm-hmm. for you? Mm-hmm. And, you know, most sex workers that I know are doing the jobs of, you know, nine people. And, you know, and they're, they're, they're not making an hourly rate that Mm -hmm. they should, that they deserve for all that labor. Yeah. All right, guys, we're going to take a quick commercial break. Um, when we come back, we're going to talk about how the industry has changed from when Cinnamon first started, um, her collective BIPOC and so much more. So hang tight. We'll be right back. Holly Randall Unfiltered is brought to you by Everly Well. Like most people, I know that the kinds of foods I eat make a difference in how I feel and how reactivity to certain foods is different for everyone. I've looked into detox diets, you know, where you eliminate all different kinds of food and then slowly add stuff back in to see how your body reacts. Way too time consuming and honestly, that takes too much diet discipline for me. That's why I jumped at the chance to take Everly Wells at home tests for food sensitivity. They make it so easy. You get a box in the mail with all the tools that you need to take the at home blood test plus easy to follow instructions. Within minutes, I had completed the test and had it boxed up and labeled, ready to be dropped off in the mail. I'm telling you, it couldn't possibly have been simpler. And when I got the results back, I could not believe how many of the foods I eat every day were foods that I am highly sensitive to. I can't wait to adjust my diet and see how I feel, armed with the knowledge of what works for my body. And here's the thing, Everly Well has over 30 at-home lab tests, so the food sensitivity test that I took is just one option. You can also test your metabolism, testosterone levels, sexual health, and yes, even for COVID. And for listeners of the show, Everly Well is offering a special discount of 20% off an at-home lab test. All you have to do is go to everlywell.com slash holly. That's everlywell, E-V-E-R-L-Y, W-E-L-L dot com slash Holly for 20% off of your next at-home lab test. Everlywell.com slash Holly. All right, we are back. So, Cinnamon, you've been in the industry. We talked about it, 29 years. Um, how, what are some of the major changes that you've seen in that time? Oh, my gosh. Um, 
One of the biggest changes that I've seen is that the industry is completely decentralized now, Mm -hmm. you know, whereas before there were a handful of, you know, there were, you know, a bunch of companies, you know, it's, you know, there was a time when there were a handful of companies and then it became like a bunch of companies. And now there's fewer companies again, but also there's so many more sex workers, Mm -hmm. right? It's like this, like when, when what we saw in 2020 is this mass onboarding of everyday people and survival sex workers um, moving into the online space. And that for me is so important to understand and recognize because so often when we think about the adult industry, we're only thinking about LA, Vegas, Miami, maybe New York. Mm. And we're only thinking about a very, very, very small sector of very privileged people, Mm. even if they are also experiencing, you know, houselessness or if they're experiencing some, some food insecurity, they're, they're still also very privileged. Right. And so, because they get all of, because they get the exposure, they have more opportunities, um, in, you know, outside of just shooting scenes, even as an in-person worker, you have a lot more opportunity to be able to charge more money if you want. And, Mm -hmm. you know, as opposed to someone who is an, is an independent, um, worker, but I think that it's, you know, so, and, and yet, even though, the mainstream industry, like pornography has been legal since 1988 and separate from, from prostitution. Mm-hmm. Um, it's still, the, the mainstream industry is still penalized and criminalized in the same way as in-person work. Mm-hmm. And so, and like, you know, one of the things that I know is that most, you know, as a black person, I know that most black sex workers I've ever met also simultaneously have to not only do mainstream porn, but also work in other types of industry, in other industries, other sectors of the industry. So you might do porn, you'll also do in-person work, you might cam, you might do phone sex, you may dance. And so it's like all of these things are connected. We can't, and so like so often, like, I mean, and you were talking about before, it's like the stigma, right? There's, there was a time when no, you know, performer would admit to doing, or few performers would admit to doing in-person work. There was so much stigma behind it. Not only that, they would refuse to work with, with other people performers who did, who did in-person it, sex work. Who yeah, did it. very the, much. The that. assumption, the horophobia that assumes that it's the in-person workers who are bringing in, you know, disease or whatever. And it's like, well, are we all not also having sex with other people outside of our work? Like yeah. what? Like, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So, um, but now it's like people are so much more open about the fact that they do in-person work. And so like, which to me is really, it's very, very powerful and, and, and important. Um, I mean, BIPOC, we, we did some statistics and we found that 60% of BIPOC sex workers are both we're doing in-person work and working online simultaneously. Mm -hmm. And so when you see those kinds of numbers, it's like, oh, well, we really do have to start to, you know, think about how to, you know, protect the most vulnerable people in the sex trades and not just the people who are, you know, tied to certain companies, you Mm -hmm. know? So tell us about, you mentioned BIPOC. Um, Tell us about that organization how it came about and what you guys are all about. Yeah, I'm so glad you asked me that. Um, So we were founded in June of 2020. We had our first meeting in May, um, shortly after George Floyd passed away. Um, You know, the adult industry, like everybody else, was going through their Black Lives Matter moment. Uh, So many performers were in the streets marching right alongside, you know, other folks (laughs) behind the the constant um, murder of, of of black people by Mm -hmm. law enforcement. And, you know, as, as other industries were also coming out on social media, talking about racism in their industry, the porn industry had its moment too. Um, We quickly saw people, you know, companies issuing their Black Lives Matter statements. Um, You know, there were companies who donated money to like the Movement for Black Lives or the Obama Foundation. And, you know, I saw that there were, you know, you know, ABN had, had scheduled a closed door meeting and expos had like a town hall. And for me, I was, and then I saw, I think Fleshlight had, um, had, um, Anna and Misty on a live to talk about racism in the industry. And I just was getting so angry and frustrated because I felt like, 
you know, this is not the first time that we've had this conversation mm -hmm. about racism. I mean, these conversations have been happening since the 70s. And it. I was so afraid that the people who were speaking out were only going to be listened to while everybody was in lockdown and there was no one working and that the minute people would go back to work, those people might be blackballed or they would just, you know, it would go back to status quo. And so I, I thought that this was a really good opportunity to pull people together so that we could have a united front about the types of, of top-down changes we wanted to see in the industry. And I also invited in um, you know, not only black performers, but but other performers of color, understanding that there are if if the Asian performers have to wait their turn for a moment, it's never going to happen. Like mm -hmm. there's not enough of them in the business. Or if Latinx performers have to wait their turn, it's never going to happen because there's not enough of them. Mm -hmm. And so um, we had a meeting ahead of the first Expos Town Hall to think about everything that really needs to change and voted on some things that we wanted to include in a statement. Um, there were some things that were harder to push through than others because people have such spirited, um, you know, opinions of them. And, and we put out a statement and, you know, we attended these meetings, you know, after the, after the industry went back to work, many of the mainstream performers did not return, but a lot of the other, like, you know, online workers who, you know, stayed and we've been really building, we, we knew right away we needed to build something that was going to be comprehensive and, and include, you know, especially because we were also in lockdown. Um, you know, there were people who wanted to strike and, um, Shine Louise Houston uh, mentioned that it's really hard to ask people to strike when you have people who don't know how they're going to feed their families mm -hmm. and or keep a roof over their head in the middle of what was what was still early in the pandemic. Um, and Jet Setting Jasmine agreed that, you know, we have to be able to put money in people's pockets. And so we decided to start fundraising so that we could at least try to give people some money to be able to sustain themselves um, during lockdown. Mm -hmm. And immediately we, we also decided to create some wraparound services. So Jasmine offered to set aside an hour every week um, for a support group, um, a stress management support group. Um, Courtney Trouble immediately jumped in and offered to help pay for our free online yoga classes so that we could offer people virtual yoga. We hired sex workers who were certified yoga instructors. We wanted to make sure that at every step of the way that we were able to put money in the pockets of sex workers. Um, we also decided to do some educational programming because it's different. Like my experience as a black performer online is totally different than a cis het white female performers experience online, the things that she might share that work for her may not work for me simply because of race and, and are the demographics of our, of our followers and our fans and the psychology behind why they're interested in, in our content also. And so we decided to um, offer peer led education to help sex workers not get out of the business, but to make money in the business. And, you know, drawing from our pool of very talented, you know, black and indigenous and people of color in the, in the business on how they navigate this work. And every, we've offered everything from cybersecurity to, you know, like, you know, social media marketing, um, navigating this work as, you know, a queer or neuro, you know, queer person in, a, you know, in a heteronormative industry. Um, we've done things around legislation and contracts and just, just so much stuff just to be able to offer people both hard and soft skills to navigate the industry. Um, but since then, like, like almost immediately we saw, I mean, I think the first year we had 344 people ask for money. And we were able to raise $20,000. We gave 16,000 of that directly to sex workers who needed, who applied for financial assistance. We paid yoga instructors. We were able to get um, pineapple support to cover the cost of, you know, of Jasmine's, um, you know, offering the, the, the support group. She was the first person to, to get money because I felt like that was just so important. And I'm like, I didn't want her to continue to offer her services for free because I'm like, you are also 
a marginalized sex worker. Yeah. Like, you know, yeah. it's like, you know, and I'm like, I wanted to make sure that she was able to continue that work um, because it's necessary um, for our, you know, for our people. And, and so we've been doing this now. We're going on our third year. Wow. So last year we really had to sit down and we kind of had to work backwards and we set up our corporate structure. We got a fiscal sponsor, set up a bank account, started doing you know, started doing grant writing mm -hmm. so that we could raise more money. Um, and and this year, we're actually right now, we're in the process of um, selecting 10 BIPOC sex workers who have expressed that they're in need of one-to-one of -one therapy. Mm -hmm. um, we'll be funding 10 people. Uh, we're looking to offer um, 10, we have 21 people total who have requested, who, who have mentioned that they also need to access therapy. So we're looking to raise another $11,000 this year just to clear those books so that we can give all of, we're doing this work in partnership with Pineapple Support where, you know, because we, we don't have the capacity to expand that way, but we do have the capacity to fundraise and give the money to someone who is doing that work. And so like everything that we've been doing has really stemmed from the needs that people are expressing to us that they have. Like mm -hmm. our legal advisor is a mental health attorney and she is just phenomenal. She also um, is very, is out about living with bipolar disorder. And the very first time we met, she was like, well, you know, what kind of services do you think that sex workers need? And I'm like, let me tell you what we need. <laughs> like, you know, I'm like, let me tell you, let me give you the rundown. It's not just about, you know, about the, you know, intellectual property. Like people really have a lot of needs and, mm -hmm. you know, we never wanted to have people give us a reason why they needed the money. We want people to be able to determine, self-determine what they need, but immediately people were very open about what their needs were. Right. And we saw a lot of housing insecurity a lot of food insecurity. Mm -hmm. um, you know, people often, you know, in that first year, everybody was like, diversify, diversify, diversify. But, you know, for the people who came to us like, seeking financial support, they were already on like five or six platforms and not making enough money mm -hmm. to house themselves. And so, you know, we've been just this slowly thinking through like, what are the most urgent needs that people have been asking about um, one of our goals the next three years is to launch a domestic violence program. We've earmarked funds currently so that when people contact us um, looking to escape violence, that we can give them money. Um, but we've been very intentional. Like we see a lot of student sex workers. We've partnered with Sex Workers Project to do some research on sex working students. We'll be working with UCSB um, to their their do they have research money to be able to help us with this research on sex working students so that we can try to give some folks some help. But we've just been so fortunate and so lucky that to start this organization when we did, mm -hmm. that we were able to, you know, to, to collaborate with some really powerful people who have been doing amazing work for decades yeah. and, you know, to be able to get the help and the support that we need so we can yeah. make lasting change. Yeah. What were some of the biggest challenge? You said you know you you got together a bunch of people of color and you guys all discussed the issues that you were facing. Was there yeah. one thing in like particular that kept coming up again and again? Yeah, the the interracial term was was a lot. People really there were a lot of people who really wanted the term gone, mm -hmm. and yet there were other folks, including myself, who felt like getting rid of the interracial term could potentially cause harm to sex workers mm -hmm. because, you know, there are people whose entire brands are built around the, the, the interracial marketing. Um, and like for me personally, I don't feel like the term needs to be gone, you know, to retrain consumers to access a different term could take 10 years. Mm -hmm. And then what happens to the people, to the performers who are impacted by that loss? And, you know, it's, I often draw the analogy but in, to the music industry. If the hip hop category was gone, then would hip hop artists, would black artists or would Latinx artists actually win any awards, mm -hmm. right? It's like, would, or would they be even further marginalized and not, not, get any access, right? It's like these, and while like, you know, Daisy Ducati said on Twitter years ago, like, you know, trophies don't pay bills. They don't, but they do give you access, right? Mm -hmm. To, you know, to interviews. It gives you access to, you know, 
feature dance appearances. It gives you access to making, you know, it's, it's a marketing strategy for many people. And so it's like, you know, what, how do we do, how do we get rid of this? What, if we get rid of this, how do we ensure that, you know, BIPOC folks in this, in the industry actually get fair treatment? Like, you know, how do we make sure that they get the same amount of coverage? How do we make sure that they, that they're included in nominations? It's like when, when you're looking at an industry where, you know, most of the reviewers, the magazines, the, you know, the platforms, the, the companies, it's all still, you know, it's very largely still a cis white, cis het white male run industry. Mm -hmm. And so when you're looking at their fantasy of what is attractive and, you know, this exoticization of, you know, women of color color or people of color, it's like the likelihood that, you know, that person who is even more marginalized is never going to get any love. Right. Mm -hmm. And so, so for me, like that, that term is, it's like, is it, is the way it's used problematic? Yes. But for me, the solution and for many other people, the solution is not to get rid of it, but to make it more inclusive. Mm -hmm. So if you have an Asian person with a white person, that's interracial. Right, because the industry only sees interracial as black people, with, usually black men, men with white with, women, with white women, not even the opposite. Yeah, I mean, like when I was still performing in mainstream, I w they my scenes were considered interracial scenes when mm -hmm. I worked with white men, like they were marketed that way, but that's not what they're thinking of. Like, do you know when you when you say interracial, you're saying black men with with white women. Mm -hmm. And so, and then there's the stereotyping that goes with the types of scenes that they're being shot mm -hmm. also. And so it's like, I think that there's a lot more work that has to be done around the term, but I don't know if I would want it gone. Like, you know, I see amateur performers and producers on Twitter all the time who use very problematic, troubling terms to market to their consumers. And, and are, you know, are they playing into XYZ stereotype? Yes. But also what happens to those performers? Because again, if it's only, if, it, if these decisions only may only impact the mainstream performers, what happens to the performer in Tennessee who's shooting content with part you know, with whomever out of their apartment or their bedroom, and now they can't access the ability to market on and be found mm -hmm. on these platforms. Right. And that's problematic. Yeah. I mean, how do you feel about these websites that are pretty much built around interracial yeah. work? I mean, you know, you talked about the, the problematic wording there, but then I've seen people argue, well, they're giving all of this work. Yep. to these people of color. How do you feel about that? Yeah, I mean, I think that it's, you know, it's hard, right? I would never want somebody to not be able to work and pay their bills. Mm -hmm. I also, and, and also, you know, we know that people make choices when, you know, that they're comfortable with. It's like, we, you can't tell somebody what they should and shouldn't be comfortable with, mm -hmm. you know, their experiences are their experiences and, and, and they are the only person that can you know, that has, that they have, that has to live with them, you know, they have to live with themselves, you know, whether they're happy with what they're doing or not. So it's like, you know, for me to try to make decisions for other people feels, feels very wrong. Um, but, and also I think that, you know, when you have these websites, you know, or when you have these companies that are shooting like black men being arrested by white women, you know, white women cops, and then having sex with them, there's a very long legacy and history of, you know, of, of, you know, not only police brutality, but, but also, you know, sexual assault. And so like, like these kinds of things I think are very problematic and we need to address those things, mm -hmm. right? You know, if you have a company that's asking black women to pose with bananas, that's problematic. Mm -hmm. Like, do you know what I mean? I had a company ask me to perform with, you know, to like pose with a water, a slice of watermelon, you know, for a box, you know, for a, like stills. And I was so, I was so uncomfortable with doing it that the white male performer offered to hold it instead. Like, do you know what I mean? And so, yeah. which is still problematic, but it's like, you know, so we have these, there are bigger issues. And I think that it's important to remember that these issues are not new. I mean, there was a, you know, the performer Sahara in the 80s who had sex with three white men wearing KKK uniforms for, for a film. And it was a huge row, like, you know, but, and also, you know, these are, so, so when we think about these subtle it's like the subtle racism mm -hmm. that that we experience in these in these scenes it it is something that that needs to 
that needs to end. Like there are ways to, you know, black people have sex with white people without it being racist. Right. Mm -hmm. And so it's like, so there's, I, I think that it's a multi-layered conversation, right? It's like, yes, people are working and they need to make money. And it's like, people have to pay their bills. I mean, I live in one of the most most expensive cities in the world, you know? So mm-hmm. it's like, Brooklyn is very expensive and New York is becoming even more expensive post-pandemic. So it's like, how do you tell people that they're not supposed to make money and work, mm-hmm. especially if the only work that's available to them is racist? And, you know, we can even turn to like, you know, like mainstream Hollywood. I mean, think about the Amos and Andes and, you know, there are a lot of black people in you know in Hollywood who had to play maids and you know they they had to shuck and jive on camera just to get work so it's like this 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 conversation that we're having isn't new or unique to the adult industry Mm -hmm. but the difference is that we live in a new era and people and and we know better like we know that these these tropes are racist and there's no excuse that these are the tropes that people think sell Mm -hmm. do you have you seen any difference? Do you think there's been any improvement in the I, last few years? Yeah, I think there are. I, I think the advent of the, you know, of the high def cell phones has made it much easier for people to be able to produce their own content. I think that, um, you know, I see, I mean, like, I, you know, I said this on, on, um, 538, like, I feel like, you know, I love the fact that people can pick up their phone and produce porn to pay their bills. Mm-hmm. You know, they don't have to buy, a high def camera. And I mean, I remember when cameras were so expensive, you know, it's like, I mean, I was running my Sony Handycam, my prosumer Handycam. I was connected to Firewire to run it into my laptop to, to be able to stream, you know, on Yahoo Messenger. And now people can just go click. Mm -hmm. And it's that accessibility means a lot to people who are trying to make money. Um, and also, you know, now there are a lot more, you know, because the prosumer com- cameras are less expensive than what they were 15 years ago, 20 years ago, we're seeing a lot more marginalized people producing their own, you know, their own movies. There's lots and lots of small studios all over the country where people where black people are producing some really gorgeous, amazing content. I mean, like I know every, everyone knows King and Jasmine, mm-hmm. like that was unheard of. 15 years ago. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, there's a company out of Atlanta called Black Touch. Their movies are beautiful, gorgeous. It looks so artistic and beautiful and gorgeous. And it just shows Black people having great sex and and not necessarily the, the type of sex that you would see in a mainstream film. Like, I mean, I love what there are just so many companies and I can't name them all off at the top of my head, but I think it has changed because the, the, there's more people who have the access to get into the business and who want to get into the business to make content with people who look like them. Yeah. So we're seeing more queer people, more trans folks, more gorgeous, beautiful, like, you know, various shades of melanin. And that is, is, is nice because people can, you know, fans, consumers get to see themselves reflected back without a negative stereotype attached to it. Yeah. And the fact that companies and and creators like this are making a living off of it shows that there's an audience out there that wants to see it. Yeah. Which I think is great. So uh, before we wrap up the interview, I just want to ask you, um, what legacy do you want to leave um, Mm. in the industry and maybe in your personal life? Oh my God. Um, I'm going to (laughs) cry. Um, the, honestly, um, the work that I'm doing is my legacy. Mm-hmm. Like it is, I want to make sure that we leave the industry a much better place than it was when I got in. You know, yeah. I want to see people. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, this is absolutely fine. Um, I want to see, I want to see change, like sustainable change. I want to see people be able to, you know, to be, I want to see people be able to be, to be cared for. I want to see companies um, treating performers like human beings, Mm -hmm. you know, and, and also their customers. Um, I think that, you know, even, you know, King Noir said once um, that he had an issue with the term girls and boys and how we describe are the scenes and performers Mm -hmm. because he felt like it was infantilizing, you know, sex workers. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when he said that, I was like, yeah, it's the reason why people get away with treating us the way that they do. 
because they treat us like we're children and we're not, we're adults. And so like, I really want to see, I want to see people being able to get the help that they need. I mean, we fight every, you know, legislatively, we're constantly being um, attacked by the anti-porn, anti-trafficking movement. And the only way to combat that is, the, the, one of the ways to combat that is not just through legislation, but also through making wide sweeping changes in the way that performers are treated and, and making sure that we center workers' rights in this industry. I mean, I grew up in Flint, Michigan. I'm a union girl through and through. Do I think a union is the right, is the right choice? Probably not because we're not attached to companies, most of us, you know? Mm -hmm. And so I really wanna see, I wanna see people being able to thrive and not just survive in this work. Mm -hmm. I wanna see these, the companies that are making all these millions and millions of dollars, I wanna see them actually like, instead of funding Movement for Black Lives or the Obama Foundation, who really don't give a fuck about sex workers. Yeah. I want to see them putting their money into sex worker led organizations that are doing the work with, you know, survival and everyday sex and working class sex workers who need th these, uh, these, our organizations are so underfunded and there are people, I mean, Desiree Alliance has, has written policy for the UN around sex worker rights. You know, it's like there, there are so many of these amazing people doing really, really good work and taking care of, you know, the day-to-day -day needs of sex workers. And our, our, our industry has gotten away for so long with separating ourselves from in-person workers. And now that line is, is, is not, that line needs to be erased. Like our, the big companies need to divest money into sex workers. Mm -hmm. You know, these, these other, all these digital companies, there's absolutely no excuse why I can do an intake with a performer on a major campsite who is able to pay her rent but eats applesauce for three days because she can't afford food. You know, they, these things are not acceptable. It is not acceptable that 1% of the industry is making hundreds of thousands of dollars a month and there are people who are starving on these platforms. And unfortunately, when... The anti-traffickers, when Nicosi, when Exodus cry, when they say that our industry is exploitive, these are the statistics that they're using yeah. to be able to get really harmful sweeping legislation to, to push us further and further underground. And ultimately, black and brown people, queer and trans people are always going to be the ones who are, you know, penalized the most. So yeah. the legacy that I really want to leave you know, because my life has been so wrapped up in this work um, for so long, I, I just, I want to see, I want to see real change. I want to see the people on the ground having the money that they need to do their work. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Cinnamon. I mean, it's obvious that you're really passionate about what you do and it's people you. like you in this industry that are going to hopefully make those changes for the better. So yeah, I, I just so. want to thank you for everything that you've done for us. Thank you so much. And, and it's been such a cry. pleasure to have you here. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's not my intention, but no, it's fine. I also like love seeing that, like, you know, yeah. you're obviously very emotionally invested in this work, yeah. which is, which is amazing. So. Thank you. Thank you for giving me a chance to come and sit and talk with you. Of course. No, it's been incredible. You've been amazing and it's been a really eye opening learning experience for me. So thank you. Yeah, <laughs> I appreciate it. Can okay. you <laughs> Can you tell everybody um, where they can find you online, yes. all the links you want to plug, yeah. all that? Yeah, um, every single one of my links um, to my OnlyFans, my campsites, like all of the things, you can find them at singleinbrooklyn.com. And I'd love to hear from you. Fantastic. And then where can people go to learn more about BIPOC? Yeah, BIPOC Collective, is, you can find it at BIPOC, that's B-I-P-O-C hyphen collective.org. And um, all of our links are there. There is a Mighty Cause link if people would like to donate to our work. Um, we are always in need of money. <laughs> you know, we have more people who need, you know, we had to shut down our um, new applications because we were just getting such an influx on a consistent basis. And we already had over 340 people waiting for funding. Yeah, right. So it's like, you know, people can, you know, I invite people to, you know, to donate. Um, because we're fiscally sponsored, people can make recurring tax deductible donations, which would be really helpful to the work that we do. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> Fantastic. Yeah. And you guys can find me at Holly Randall on Instagram and on Twitter. 
And um, of course, if you want to support this podcast and watch these interviews live, go to patreon.com slash Holly Randall Unfiltered. Thank you guys so much for joining us. Thank you, Cinnamon, Thank for you, Holly. your time. <laughs> and I'll see you guys next week.